you'd like to support my guitar building YouTube channel, visit eGuitarPlans.com and buy a plan. A link is in the description below. Now on with the video. Hey guys, in this episode of From the Luthier's Workbench, I'm going to actually start building the Oak Butcher Block guitar. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by making the fretboard, then I'll make the next shaft, then I'll bring those two parts together uh, as you see it here. So let's jump in and get started. The first thing I had to do was to carve a Fire Breathing Dragon as the 12th fret inlay. And this was done using two passes, one with a 16th inch bit and then one with a 32nd of an inch bit. Next, I painted the inside of the carving with some white paint, which will help the glow in the dark powder that I plan to use as my inlay stand out better. And after the paint had dried, I filled the routing with some aqua glow in the dark strontium illuminate powder. Then I used a brush just to make sure to clean up all the excess glow-in-the-dark powder and to make sure that all the gaps were filled in the inlay. Next, I flooded each of the cavities with water-thin CA glue, and this will uh, saturate that glow-in-the-dark powder and make sure that it adheres firmly to the inside of the inlaid cavity. Then I let it sit for about 10 minutes and then hit it with some accelerator and that gives it this unique crystal-like look. And then after it dried, I took a block of wood with some sandpaper and sanded down the surface flush with the wood. The same process was used for applying the red glow in the dark powder. And here I'm using a toothpick to make sure I get every nook and cranny filled. And once it had dried, I sanded down the surface level. The next step was to cut the fret slots, and here I'm using a .024 inch two flute spiral up cut bit to cut those slots. Then I used an eighth inch two flute spiral up cut bit to cut the radius as well as the perimeter shape of the fretboard. Once that was done, I grabbed a hacksaw blade to cut the tab so I could liberate the fretboard from the blank. Next, I wrapped a block of wood with some 80 grit sandpaper so I could sand down the remaining nubs. And here I'm using a marking tool to mark out the position of the side marker dots, which will also be made with glow-in-the-dark powder. Next, I grabbed my drill with a 3 seconds inch bit and drilled shallow holes for each of the marker dots. To apply the glow-in-the-dark powder, the first thing I do is I fill the holes with water-thin CA glue. Then I used a short length of plastic tubing to scoop up the powder and deposit it right into the hole and around the area and make sure that it gets thoroughly packed in and soaked with the CA glue. And then later on, after the glue is dried, I'll sand off the excess level with the side of the fretboard. Now it's time to move on to carving the neck, and that starts by carving out the slot for the truss rod using a 1 8 inch diameter two flute spiral upcut bit. Then I used a quarter inch diameter two flute spiral upcut bit to cut the face of the angled headstock. Once this operation was complete, the top side of the neck was finished, and now I could move on to cutting the back side of the neck. However, before I could start cutting on the CNC, I had to use my bandsaw to cut away some of the excess on the blank. This will greatly reduce the amount of time it takes to carve the heel and the back contour of the neck on my CNC machine. Now, since I use the exact center of my blank on both sides to register the carving operations, I have to remark the center line as well as where the exact center is on the back of the blank where I cut away the excess wood. And then after making sure that the blank was square with my CNC machine, I clamped it down and then moved my router to the exact center of the blank so that I could begin cutting the back operations, which is basically the same as the front. I first carved the headstock and then followed up with a 
carving operation to cut the contour and the heel. I always use a two-pass cutting operation. The first hogs out most of the wood, and then the second, which you see here, is the finishing operation, which smooths out the surface. At this stage, the neck carving operation is complete, so I can remove the blank, and then I'll take it over to my bandsaw, which is how I'll cut the tabs to liberate the neck from the blank. Now the next step involves gluing the fretboard down to the neck. And to do that, the first thing I have to do is install my truss rod. Then I'll place a piece of masking tape over the truss rod to keep glue from getting down into the channel. And the glue that I like to use here is Type Bond 3. I'll apply a bead of glue on both sides of the masking tape, and then I'll use my pinky to spread the glue around. Next, I'll remove that masking tape, and then I'll use my pinky once again to move some of that glue a little bit closer to the slot without getting too much down in there. It's not that big a deal because the truss rod is wrapped in plastic. Then I'll grab a pinch of salt and sprinkle some grains in a few locations along where the fretboard will be glued down. This keeps the fretboard from sliding around as I apply clamping pressure. And what's that old saying about never having too many clamps? Then I'll leave the clamps in place for 6 to 10 hours, or usually overnight, which is plenty of time to let the glue dry. Then I'll grab one of my Japanese Iwasaka files and use that to scrape off the, the glue squeeze out that happens along the seam where the fretboard meets the neck. Now for the most part, my CNC machine will leave a surface that can be sanded with 220 grit sandpaper. However, there are a couple of areas where tool marks are more pronounced. So I'll take my neck over to my oscillating spindle sander and sand off those tool marks and get the surface nice and smooth so that I can proceed with final sanding. You know, I've had people email me or comment that they find the process of cutting, carving, and sanding by hand to be therapeutic. And I would agree 100%. You need therapy. All right, guys. Well, that's all the time I have for this episode. And I think for the next episode, what I'm going to do is drill the holes for the tuners. I will fine-tune the fretboard, although it's pretty, pretty close to being ready to go. And then I'll press in the frets. And I need to get all that done before I can start on the body. So uh, that's, I think that's what I will plan on accomplishing in the next episode. But for now, my impression of this neck is, uh, compared to say a, a maple neck, uh, it's a little bit heavier. I definitely can feel a little bit more weight. I wish I had a finished maple neck laying around that I could weigh in comparison to this one. But I would say what I'll probably do is I'll weigh this. And then down the road when I do have a maple neck, I'll weigh it in comparison. But I'm going to say it's maybe five to six ounces heavier than a maple neck. Uh, maybe a little bit more. But... Um, it does feel definitely strong enough and sturdy enough. So if you've ever wondered whether or not you can make a guitar neck out of oak, there you go. <laughs> you can definitely make a, a neck out of oak. So, well, that's it for this episode. Um, be sure if you like this video to give me a thumbs up. That's really what uh, YouTube uses in its metrics. And um, as always, head over to eGuitar Plans if you want to purchase a plan for a guitar or you know, one of the different tools that I use, including my CNC machine. And in the next episode, we'll continue with this build and hopefully get a little bit closer. So until the next episode, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.